Hey folks, this is Pastor Mike, and you're listening to our Wednesday night Bible study online. We hope you enjoy this, and you can hear more of our sermons and teachings at www.visitbethelchurch.org. God bless you, and have a great day. Genesis chapter 29, if you would turn there please. Genesis chapter 29, and we'll just spend uh, uh, just a, a short amount of time in the Word of God tonight. I pre- appreciate you being here, and appreciate you um, wanting to learn something from God's Word. Um, there's, there's, a, there's some really, really, really good things here. And I, w- I'm, I may just kind of move through quickly some of these things here, uh, to get to this, this idea of Jacob. And this is the story of Rachel and Leah. And then we have, um, in this story, we have the, the birth. And, and I like this now, the birth of the first four, uh, children of Israel. Okay. The birth of the first four. And I think that's very important. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 29, verse 1, Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. And a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered together, or excuse me, flocks gathered. And they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And and they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together. Until they roll the stone from the well's mouth, then we water the sheep. And, and I, what I want to do is I want to spend a lot of time dealing with the symbolism here of, of the sheep. Uh, they, that God can't water them until they be gathered together. And, and I will tell you that this chapter is full of promises to the nation of Israel. It is full of promises to them. The three flocks of sheep. The fact that they're going to be gathered together one of these days. And the fact that... This well, and we know what a well represents in the Bible. It represents the waters of life. It represents salvation. It represents the Bible. It represents all of those things to us in the scriptures. And I want you to notice that there is a stone on top of this well. Okay? Now, anytime you see a stone in the Bible, you're to think of Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, Unless that stone is carved. And if that stone is carved, then who is it? It's the Antichrist. Because in Revelation 13, an image is going to be set up to the beast, an image of the beast. Okay, so a carved stone is an idol, the idol shepherd, the Bible calls him. So it represents the Antichrist. But in this case, we have just a stone. It's a stone cut without hands. That's Daniel chapter 2. That was in Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And that stone cut without hands was the, was the kingdom of Christ that comes to the earth that crushes and destroys all of the previous kingdoms and uh, becomes a, a high mountain. But here we have a stone. And I want you to think of another story in the Bible where a stone was, was covering something up. We have, of course, we have the resurrection of Jesus, and that stone was rolled away, and I want you to think about that. But we also have the story of Lazarus. And Lazarus was in the grave four days, and he stinks, okay? He's dead. And Christ wants to resurrect him, but there is a stone in the way. And there's a, there's a great sermon I heard, and I try to pass that on wherever I can, uh, uh, and there's an application here to Israel. Israel is in the grave right now. They're dead. Okay, They're the dry bones that Ezekiel proph- prophesied to in the last days. And they're dead right now. And some might think that they're so dead that they can't be saved. And I'll tell you what, but for the most part, Jews don't like the New Testament. And they will resist it whenever possible. They can't handle this, this Goyim Bible, they call it. Okay, we're the Goyim, we're the Gentiles, and that's sort of a slang term, like a curse word that they use for us because we're not Jews. But by and large, they're very, very dead. But I will tell you that I have a Savior that it doesn't matter how dead they are, God can raise them back to life. Can I hear you say amen? And even in those dry bones... Uh, the, the word of God was prophesied, the bones came back together, and then he prophesied again to the, f- to the four winds, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's enough wind, amen? 
and it resurrects those dry, dry bones and gives them breath and gives them life and they become the, the living army of God and that's the restoration of Israel in the last days. But here was an interesting take. Brother Reg Kelly came and preached this here several years ago and I like the spin that he put on this thing because when Jesus was standing in front of that tomb of Lazarus and that stone was there covering that tomb, Jesus didn't do this with his hands, you know, like you would see Charlton Heston do on the movies, you know, and make this big, and, and the stone just miraculously rolled away. He told those who were in attendance, he said, take ye away the stone. And he, he talks about the stone being Christ, but Christ is, he's the, he's the stone of the foundation, the head, the, uh, the chief cornerstone. But the Bible says that to Israel, Christ is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Okay? And he used that illustration here to, to picturize the people that he told the people that put the stone there that they had to take that thing away. And the message that we got out, I'll tell you what, I just the first time I heard that, I was just like, I was just sitting there like this going. And automatically in my mind, every human being that I had ever offended in my life was coming to my mind. Okay? And we, we are very offensive people. We say things that are mean, cruel, rough. We offend people with our language. We offend people with our actions. People who know us to be church members or church goers, when we do something in front of them that they, they, they categorize as not Christian and lost people know more about what it takes to be a Christian than some Christians do. When they see us do things like that, what we have done, we have put a stone of offense in front of them. Okay? And we have, we basically have barred them from the gospel. They're not coming to church. You can invite them all day long, but until that stone is removed, a lot of times they're not coming. Can I hear you say amen? Okay. Now I want you to think, think of this, this well here, this well of water. It represents salvation. And the flocks, the, Jesus is, of course, the shepherd. He's the great shepherd. The flocks are his sheep. Uh, he referenced, he talks about in the New Testament, he talks about the lost sheep. Of the house of Israel. And I just kind of want you to get this picture here very quickly. Because then we're going to move on. But here these sheep are. And he said uh, in verse 8. He said they cannot. We cannot. We cannot water and feed them. Until all the flocks be gathered together. And I'm here to tell you. I, I've been through the prophecies. I've been looking at some things today. And I can tell you that God once again is going to gather together the people. When is it going to happen? Well in the Old Testament. You know how they used to send a signal out to gather everybody? You know what they would do? They would blow it. They had two trumpets of silver. And I, I tell you what, I, like, I dealt with this today. I did three online Bible studies this afternoon. I was just, man, I just one after another. And what I did was I was looking at the trumpets in the Bible. And those two trumpets of silver, you know what? I, and I'd never read this before until I saw this today. But God said, make the two trumpets of silver. And both of them were to be made out of one single piece of silver. You know what I get out of that? Okay, here's the two trumpets, Old Testament, New Testament, and this is and this is all one piece of silver. Psalm 12 says, "The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord; thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever." And I'm telling you right here, this is the preserved word, the one piece of silver that makes two silver trumpets. And and what happens is, God said, and, and there was He gave different instructions for them, but He said, when you blow them, when you blow both of them together. Then we're going to assemble all of my people together. And all through the scriptures, the Bible talks about a trumpet blowing and the people being assembled. And I want to tell you something, and I, and I will say this tonight. One of the things that attracts people to our church, and, it, and we may not be reaching uh, 100 or 150 or 100,000 people in Jefferson County anywhere, but we are attracting people to our church for one reason. And that is, we're blowing the trumpet. And the trumpet is the word of God. John was on the Lord's day and he was praying in the spirit and he heard a voice behind, he heard a great voice behind him as of a trumpet and it was Jesus Christ. This is his voice right here. Amen. Uh, boy, I'm here. I am pre re preaching this thing all over again. It was just such a good time in the, in the study of God's word. Uh, but anyway, that's when the, Israel is going to be gathered together one of these days when the trumpets begin to sound. That's Revelation 8 and 9. Okay, the seven trumpets are going to sound and God is going to gather his people together once again. So he says, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together and until they roll the stone from the well's mouth, then 
we water the sheep. And I will also say this as well. Uh, this has a lot to do with what I've been preaching the last couple Sundays about the open and closed book. Okay? Until God's ready to open the well's mouth, that well's mouth is not being opened. Okay? And in your life, And in your life, until God's ready to open it up, it's not going to be open. Jesus is the one who opens and no man closes. And he's the one who closes and no man opens. It is all of the Lord. Can I hear you say amen? So anyway, just just kind of throw that in there. Now verse 9. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her, her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. That must have been some kiss. I I don't know if she remembers, but I remember the first kiss I planted on Lisa. I don't remember crying. I I don't remember her crying. Okay, which I guess was good. Okay, uh, but anyway, and, and and you know what he you know what he's doing? This man's not weeping because he thinks, man, what am I what am I going to do with this gal? Okay, he is happy in the Lord that God has provided him a wife, and he knows it. I mean, he knows it right here and there that God has blessed him and provided him a wife. The Bible says in verse twelve, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother, and that he that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him, and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. I like that. Okay, thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me what shall thy wages be. Now here, get this picture. Jacob just kind of moves in with Laban and he helps him there on the farm. Helps him tend the sheep and helps him with chores and this and that and the other. And so Laban, and I'm sure Laban can see what's going on here. Okay, he probably heard about the kiss. He kind of knows what's going on. But anyway, Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. So we have one sister that is drop-dead gorgeous, and that's the one that... I want you to get this picture now. This is the one that Jacob picked. Okay? This was the first... This was his first love. Okay? And I I want you to get a hold of that. Leah, however, is the older sister, okay? She didn't get all the looks of the family, okay? Or maybe she did, okay? Maybe she got all the looks, the bad looks of the family, but whatever. But she's not as pretty. She's not a fair of countenance and this and that and the other. The Bible says she's tender-eyed, so maybe she's, I don't know, maybe she's a little droopy in the eyelids or just something, something, you know, something not right about her, okay? But anyway, so verse 18 And Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Now, the number seven is the number for the completion of what God's going to do. Okay? He always ends things with seven. Uh, there was the, the, uh, the, the seven, the seven days of the week, and on the seventh day, God rested, and God blessed. The, the, the number seven is a prophetic picture of the millennial reign of Christ. It will be the seventh day in God's calendar. We have the first six days, which are the 6,000 years. This is why you ought to believe the Bible instead of science. Amen? You believe the Bible instead of science, then you'll get it. If you believe the Bible about the past, then it'll help you believe the Bible about the future. Amen? Okay, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I suspect that a lot of these scholars out there that don't believe in the literal interpretation of the millennial reign or the, or the time frames of the Bible secretly believe that the earth is a lot older based upon what science has told them rather than what the Bible. They don't just doubt the Bible in one place. They doubt it all over the place. Can I hear you say amen? But that's what that is. That's what that pick. God is putting that number in there for you so that you understand that this represents something that is going to happen in the last days. Now... Uh, he said, verse 19, Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Now, here, here's the deal. Jacob worked on this man's farm for seven years. Then he was able to marry Rachel. 
Okay? But Laban is... Now watch this, because they all come from the same family. Laban is the same kind of guy that Jacob is. He's a cheat. Okay? Jacob was a cheat. Laban is a cheat. Okay? What goes around, comes around. Okay? And that, that's kind of a lesson that you get out of this. Is that that's, that's kind of what happens. Jacob, in fact, Jacob got cheated more than once from Laban. Okay? I mean, he spent a long time working for this guy. And finally, he had to pack his family up and said, we're out of town. Okay? We, we're not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to let the man cheat me no more. Okay? But anyway, but so he loved her. And he, seven years has passed now. And it just seemed like a, it just seemed like a few days. Okay? And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. That must have been some feast. Okay? That must have been some wild doodad. Okay? Because, I mean, you kind of get the idea here that... uh, uh, Laban takes Leah, puts her in a tent, okay? He, is, he has cheated Jacob out of marriage to his younger daughter, okay? He probably realizes this is Leah's only chance right here, okay? And so he puts her in that tent. Jacob is out feasting, having a good time. He's probably, he's probably drank some wine. The Bible doesn't say that. But I don't have any other explanation for him going into this tent and spending all night with this gal, not knowing it was her until he woke up the next morning. Okay, and I'm just kind of throwing that in there. But anyway, uh, verse 23, And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah's daughter and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah, his maid for an handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. Okay, what a surprise. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did I not serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore thou, then hast thou beguiled me that's a serpent term if i ever see one in the bible amen okay verse 26 and laban said it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn and i'm sure jacob was probably saying why didn't i know that seven years ago i mean i've been in your land for seven years and a month and i'd never heard of this little tradition here okay because i'm sure i would have negotiated something along those lines okay but remember jacob is just getting back to done to him what he did to Esau okay and I know it was fulfilled God's plan and I know know all this stuff but I'm telling you what Jacob did ought not to be done among brothers amen and and yet God blessed it God blessed him but what Jacob done to his own brother ought not be done to brothers now now that's to be a practical application for us sitting here tonight amen that you ought not treat, that you ought not cheat one another, lie to one another, try to, try to beguile somebody that's in your church or that's a brother or sister in the Lord or even of your own family. You ought not try to do that. Somebody say amen. Don't lie. Don't try to cheat people. Don't try to get ahead on everybody. Don't try to do that. You talk to old Reg Kelly. Reg is an auctioneer. And he, he auctions, he auctioneers a lot of these estate sales where daddy's dead and mama's dead. And they have all this stuff that they've got to sell off. And he said, I've seen, he said, I've seen the kids come in and fight over the stupidest things in the farmhouse and in the barn and everything. He said, I've seen it. He said, it makes me sick. Churchgoers coming in, fighting over little things that mom and daddy have. Cheating one another, lying about one another. Ought not be named among God's, God's people. Amen? Okay? And, and seriously... God may forgive the sin, but a lot of times he will make us live through the consequences of it. And not out of judgment and wrath or anything else, but as a training tool to let us know, let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. Let it be known among you that when you say yes, that's exactly what that means. And when you say no, that's exactly what that means. Be a man or a woman of your word. If you say that you're going to do something, then do it. And if you think you're going to have trouble doing it, then don't say you're going to do it. It's a lot, you're a lot better off not giving your word to something and failing and, 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 you know, not, not having that than to jump ahead in something and jump into something and not be able to perform it. How many of y'all know that? Say amen. Okay. We've got, we've got quit written inside of us. 
We've got give up and I don't want to do this anymore written inside of us. Okay, so be people of your word. Now, so anyway, what is this thou hast done? You, you beguiled me, and it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Now, verse 27, fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel his daughter to wife also. And Laban uh, gave to Rachel his daughter Billah, his handmaid, to be her maid. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. Now, um, I've, I've, let, me just, let me just do this real quickly. Uh, we won't have to turn there. In, Daniel, in the book of Daniel chapter 9, it mentions a 70-week time prophecy uh, that is extended to the house of Israel. Okay, 70 weeks. A lot of the scholars, and I'm, I'm not casting any doubts on anybody, but they all say, well, those, that 70 weeks is, is 70 periods of seven years. That's not what it says. And I dealt with this in a Revelation Bible study I've been doing. And I had people say, well, right here it says fulfill her week and then he had to work seven years. So it says a week is seven years. But that's not what this passage says. He worked seven years to get to the original marriage date. And he ended up being with Leah. Okay, And then it says fulfill her week. So he fulfilled her week. And then Rachel was given to him, and he went in under her, and then he worked the rest, the next seven years. That's, is that what you see in that text? That's exactly what I'm seeing in here. And so I don't see that a week equals seven years in this text. Okay? That's not what I'm seeing. At literally, literally, and that's, that's the easiest way to take the Bible, is just take it for what it says. Okay? And, um, so what happened was, is that he, once he had, once he had gone into Leah, he had to, he had to fulfill a marital obligation of seven days to her. Okay. And then at the end of that seven days, then now he is free to marry and go in unto Rachel, but then he has to work another seven years in order to gain an and, and in order to pay the, the, the price or the wages or whatever it is, that's what he has to do in order to earn it, okay? So, I mean, I'm sure he's gritting his teeth and biting his tongue and everything else in the world. And he probably walked, walked up in the woods and shouted out a few things, okay? And then probably turned around and come back and said, okay, okay? But I want to tell you something. Remember that Rachel is his first and his true love, okay? Now, um... This, this is part of a repeated pattern. Now, I'm not going to get to the rest of the chapter. I'm going to close right now. This is part of a repeated pattern in the scripture of, the, of God's plan of salvation, both for the Gentile and to the Jew. Jesus came and presented himself, not as king of the Gentiles, but as king of the Jews. He came and presented himself to Israel first. He presented himself, came as one of their brethren sat among them, healed them, raised their dead, sat in their temple, taught in their synagogues, opened the book to them. He did everything in the world. When he died on the cross, he was the high priest who had the names of the tribes of Israel upon his heart, just like Aaron the high priest had on that, on that breastplate that he wore when he went into the most holy place. Jesus, when he was on the cross, had the names of Israel, of the tribes of Israel on his heart. When he was dying on the cross because he knew that he was dying for the sins of his own people first. Israel, the Jew, the 12 tribes of Jacob, they are God's first love. They are his first love. Okay? We need to, we need to deal with that. Okay? But Jesus said, he who is last shall be first, and he who is first shall be last in the kingdom of God. And he's teaching this principle here. So, and, and just like with Jacob and Esau, Esau was born first, but Jacob then receives the blessing of the inheritance. And now we have the same thing with the wives. Even though Rachel is younger, Rachel is the first love of Jacob. He ends up marrying and taking Leah as his bride, and he gives her children. He blesses her and gives her children by this. But really and realistically, Rachel is the true love. And you need to understand this because we're living in a time right now where the world is starting to turn their back on Israel. Okay, And I'm not talking about Israel as a state or a nation or whatever, whatever deal they got going over there. From what I know, the Israel spy organization is about as evil and ruthless as the American one. 
Okay? The, the government of Israel is not pro-God, it's not pro-Jesus, it's not pro-Gospel, it's not anything like that. And I'm not necessarily talking about this organized nation that they have over there. They may be the dry bones put together, but they have no breath in them. Because the Jews do not believe the Gospel. They do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But I will tell you that at some point the veil is going to be lifted. The trumpet is going to sound. They're going to know the certain sound of the trumpet. And God is going to gather them together just like he did the dry bones. And he's going to resurrect their dead body and give them life once again. And if you don't, if you don't, if you don't quite get that, I'm here to tell you that that's the message of the Bible. That is the message of the Bible. We are a wild branch grafted in. Okay? And what and what I see and what I see in a lot of American Christianity is a lot of a lot of pride, a lot of um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Boasting. We act like we're the select people of God because we're the church, we're the glorious church in this and that and the other. And God, you go read Romans 11. God said, "I put you in, I take you out. I took Israel, I took the natural branch off." Okay? That's what God said. And especially in America, Christianity is, is too big for its britches. Okay? God's going to have to cut us down a notch, and I will tell you that there will come a time. Listen to this now. There will come a time when God will cut off salvation to the Gentiles. Mark it down. The door is fixed to be shut on the ark. And God's going to cut off salvation to the, to the Gentiles, and he's going to then turn his efforts toward Israel. Okay? Now, we are the Gentiles. And I believe that we are, we are short on time. God's long suffering and his forbearance lasts for a while. God's put up with us for a long time. But if we're, if we're, if you think that we're closer, even if by one day to the Lord's coming and the time when he cuts it off and blows those trumpets and cuts it off, that ought to make us that much more live for God, pray to God, study God's word. Meditate on God's word. Clean up our act a little bit. Amen. Because I'm telling you, Rachel is his true love. And he will work and he will toil and he will labor until he gets, he finally gets his true love. Don't ever underestimate God's love for Israel. Amen. Hello folks, Pastor Mike here, and sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation, and some people just don't know what that is, and I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God and uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans six twenty three, for the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches, and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven that God gives to those that are saved. But we also believe in e eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard 
is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has, has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now. And you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you. And God is trying to make you so that you just like our parents used to do. God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God. We repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life. And you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept his free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in his word, and God has never broken his word. God promised in his word that he would forgive you and that he would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.